Thank you very much, Hillary, for a very kind introduction. Skip, for inviting us out. Nikolai, for your hospitality. Bob, for the fantastic tour. Uh, and for the students in the community of the Clinton Library. This is uh, really an honor and a privilege uh, for us to be here. Um, let me see if I can get the, the, the technology right. Although, I, I do have to warn you about one thing. I'm a little bit uncomfortable about being up here in a no-tech zone because I'm not sure I know how to teach and lecture without people uh, being down in the you know, face in their, in their iPods or whatever. Um, what we really want to sort of begin with is this idea that popular culture actually plays a role in facilitating uh, political discussion. And I think that it, there's no more apt place to be able to do something like this than here at the Clinton Library, because I think President Clinton understood the role in which popular culture can play for engaging an otherwise disaffected audience for bringing them back into the cultural conversation. And there's actually very little uh, that we can associate, I think, with the president that isn't actually facilitated in part by reflections through popular culture and walking through the library, seeing uh, him always with the saxophone calls to mind the images uh, of him on the Arsenio Hall show. And of course, the infamous Daryl Hammond thumb uh, is a big part of that as well, right, in terms of our understanding of that presidency. Well, John Street in 1997, who was writing in the age uh, in which President Clinton uh, was in office, talked about how contemporary politics is actually facilitated, is played through the language of popular culture. Uh, that not only are candidates and politicos understanding the role of popular culture and connecting with people, but people within the area of popular culture see this as a vehicle for actually communicating political messages. For a street noted, it's a way in which we can actually take our everyday lives, our everyday democracy, and appropriate them in different ways. In other words, taking things that we're familiar with and actually delivering a message in the form of comedy and entertainment. And as Paul Cantor in 2001 noted, uh, that for the most part, popular culture, especially within our increased fractionalized news audience in this country and with the increasing sort of polarity of our political discussions, popular culture is actually forming the basis for common culture, for common discussion. Uh, you know, we may not all agree on a lot of things politically, but almost everyone is in the theater with their 3D glasses on seeing what's happening in Pandora. So it's a way in which then we are seeing democracy, citizenship, identity, all being captured and represented to us in a way that actually delivers political messages and themes. And in thinking about this, we, we started thinking about, well, how do we communicate this really in the best way possible so that we can see effect of popular culture? Well, one of the ways is to look at how people actually learn uh, about, uh, about political information. The first way is through what we call first-ordered knowledge, which is where people actually directly get involved in politics, something that's communicated very well uh, in this school here. Uh, but we find that even though uh, individuals can learn about politics by being directly engaged, when we look at the actual levels of engagement within the United States, we see relatively low levels. Even in our highest level, which is voting, across a span of time, we actually don't have a fully engaged citizenry. Right? So if people are learning about politics through participation, then not very many people are learning all that much about politics and democracy. So a second way is actually through information that's directly mediated through us through traditional news sources. Even then, however, we're seeing a decline in newspaper readership. We're seeing a decline in nightly news uh, viewing. We're seeing a, a fractionalization, again, of news audiences. The way in which media is conveying information to us, even in this second ordered form, is on the decline in the United States. So where is it that people are getting their understanding of political information? Well, this is where we begin to explore this third ordered knowledge, knowledge that's mediated via popular culture venues. I explore this a little bit uh, in, my, in my first book, uh, Homer Simpson Goes to Washington. Later, he actually takes it to the street and marches. Uh, and we find that actually these kinds of images uh, are, are in fact engaging people directly. In 2008, we look at the number of entertainment media appearances that candidates had, the use of social networking, Facebook, MySpace, the use of campaign texting in order to be able to provide people, including the media, with information. Viral internet messaging, Will I Am's uh, Obama videos that mix in celebrity appearances by a very pregnant Jessica Alba talking about the future that she wants to create for, for her child. And of course, advertising in video games. Uh, there's uh, uh, images in, in John Madden 2008, an EA Sports game, NBA Live 2008, uh, and a street box racer for Xbox that actually have billboards 
uh, that are directing game players to go to VoteForChange.com with a picture of Barack Obama. So, I mean, there, there are ways in which then individuals began to really see this. And in 2008, we saw more of a saturation of this kind of popular culture, media culture, uh, than we had ever really seen previously. And it seemed to work. In 2008, we saw a uh, youth vote go up uh, roughly uh, over 2.2 million uh, over 2004. Uh, the numbers of voters uh, under 30 uh, was actually at its third highest point uh, in American history. And when we look at the uh, election returns uh, in terms of the, the number of youth who voted for now President Obama, we see they captured the youth vote uh, far superior to John McCain, uh, who was not as active in using these kinds of, of fora in order to be able to engage uh, a youth audience. Uh, and in this regard, then, we see that popular culture has come a, a long way in connecting us with the political system, in forming our identities, and is being used as a tool by candidates. So what begins as a 15-second sound clip of Richard Nixon uh, saying, sock it to me. Now all of a sudden we have candidates who are appearing actively on these shows who are doing so because it is the way that they're going to connect with a demographic that they otherwise would never have come into contact with. Now that being said, it plays also a further role in formation of identity and causing us to think about issues in a particular way. And for that, I'd actually like to turn it over to my colleague, Tim Dale. Thank you, Joe, and I also want to thank you for having us today. Uh, Skip tells us right before we start, make this fun, make this enjoyable, but uh, part of our insecurity is that, number one, we're never going to be as funny as the Simpsons or all in the family. <laughs> uh, it's much more interesting to just watch television uh, than watch us. Um, the other thing is, and I, I, I warned my students this at the beginning of the semester when, I, when we teach this stuff, um, that um, we, we have a way of making shows academic and therefore uh, less fun to watch. So I, I think probably more than anything we watch people's ability or we ruin people's ability to watch a movie. They, they can't go to the movies anymore without thinking, you know, what am I, what, what, what values are being uh, told to me? What, what political messages are, are being uh, communicated? Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that, um, that, that we are interested in talking about is um, how we understand the public sphere and political participation. And uh, one of the, kind of the traditional way of understanding the public sphere um, is that it's where we engage in political activity. So we know we're in the public sphere if we leave here and have a public conversation or a public debate about something. We know we're in the public sphere if we're holding a protest sign out in front of the state capitol. Um, but uh, if this is only the place, if this is the only place we consider to be the public sphere, um, then we think we're missing something. We think we're missing um, a, a very broad range of activities that really inform um, our political lives, even if it's not us uh, directly trying to influence government. We're being influenced by people who want to influence us. And so um, if we look kind of away from a traditional conception of the public sphere, where um, only our policy-oriented activity counts, uh, so to speak, um, in direct action politics, and broaden that to a more expanded conception of the public sphere, um, we end up with a vision of the public sphere that has multiple publics, multiple places where we engage in political activity that may not be the traditional form of political activity. Um, also, we end up with complex public spheres. What's going on in the public sphere? Are we just arguing that we want government to change? Or are we also arguing that we want citizens to change? We want society to change? We want values to change? Um, and so we have what, and, and uh, this is actually taken from political theory literature on public sphere, um, but uh, we, I talk in the book about strong versus weak publics. Uh, some public spheres, some public uh, performances are intended to influence public policy and political behavior. Uh, but then there are what are, are identified as weak publics, not weak because they aren't effective, but weak because they aren't engaged in that kind of direct action, intentional political activity. And weak publics are publics in which our identities are formed. So um, if we engage in um, discussions with our family or at church or um, watch a movie or television, and we come away from that experience slightly changed, um, our politics are also changed. What we do with our lives changes, why we care about the community and what ways we care about the community, um, those are all changed. 
And so um, we think it's limiting, overly limiting, to think of the public sphere and public action in the more narrow way um, that, frankly, political scientists um, t tend to think of it. And so um, this really opens the door for us to consider how our democracy functions in some of these public spheres, public performances, that we don't always think of as traditionally political. And so uh, in the, Homer Simpson marches on Washington, if we're going to understand the ways in which popular culture engages our political imagination. We end up with uh, thinking about popular culture as um, conducting political activity along certain fronts, or maybe um, along certain goals or um, accomplishments. Um, first, popular culture texts can expose issues that might otherwise be overlooked. So um, there, there are conventional ways of thinking about a problem. Um, there are conventional ways of thinking about a certain social phenomenon. And popular culture can expose that. So um, it, it, you know, the book is Homer Simpson Marches on Washington. The book is about contemporary popular culture. But it's also about how popular culture has been doing this for a long time. And one of the first examples we talk about in the book is uh, the, the character Archie Bunker in All in the Family. And for as uh, smart and funny as that show was, and at number one in the ratings for so many years, um, it also really took a hard edge challenging conventional views on issues. So um, I, I talk in my chapter about the issue where um, one of Archie's football buddies is gay, and they have a confrontation in a bar, not really a confrontation, because uh, Archie's jaw is pretty much just slack-jawed the whole time, and, and he can't believe what's going on. And th this was really the, the first time, and you had a major show being watched by millions of people, even Richard Nixon is watching it, there's a comment he has on his Nixon tapes where he uh, saw the episode and, and it kind of has this outburst, think of the children, um, what are you doing uh, on television? Um, but it really does expose issues. So all the way back to um, All in the Family, um, and even earlier, we have popular culture uh, showing that it can bring things out that people are talking about. So we imagine that in millions of households across the country, there's either awkward silence sitting in the living room, um, which of course is, does something, um, or there's a conversation. What do you think about that? What, what happened in that episode? Um, why, what, was it funny? Was it not funny? Why, why am I feeling slightly uncomfortable? Because that was just on television. Um, the second thing that popular culture can do is legitimize viewpoints um, that were pre previously marginalized. So um, in the case of All in the Family, we also have this uh, idea where um, you have ideas or values or um, uh, you know, issues of race, um, issues of gender, uh, that um, aren't necessarily accepted, but that are being pushed constantly in popular culture. So um, oftentimes we, we, we uh, look to the example of Ellen, the Ellen show back in the 90s, which along the same lines as that Archie episode I talk about, um, really pushes culture in a direction where we are a different society today because Ellen's show was on television. Um, and even though it's the, the pop culture text is pushing these issues, um, it ends up legitimizing them because more people watch them, more people accept them. And the final thing that pop culture can do, and this is probably the closest it gets to um, actually affecting um, policy or political change, is when it sets an agenda. So um, when uh, popular culture says this issue is important, or a popular culture text says that this issue is important, it can put it on our agenda, either our discussion agenda, our legislative agenda. And so um, these are three distinct ways that popular culture texts um, can really uh, push us in political directions, um, but we may not see these as direct political action, but we still think they should be considered uh, political activities. So um, the book is full of examples. In fact, um, the, the, each chapter in the book is dedicated to a different popular culture text or collection of texts. And you see a range of examples of where um, certain uh, uh, music or movies or television shows um, do particularly a, a, an effective job at advancing a, 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 a message of dissent. Um, and some examples uh, that we can point to as overt messaging, these are um, uh, pop culture texts or become pop culture texts that are um, created with a particular message in mind. Um, you may recall Al Gore's In Inconvenient Truth, a documentary um, released widely in theaters. Uh, it, it, we, we joke in, in professorial circles that if only our PowerPoint lectures could garner that much box office uh, 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 fervor. 
Um, but an inconvenient truth is a lecture on the environment, and yet it's engaging, entertaining, and Al Gore, through producing a film, changes and affects the public dialogue. Uh, so documentary filmmaking is really where we see uh, these overt messages. Uh, you might also recall after September 11th, all of uh, movie stars and musicians got together and they simulcast on all the major networks, America, a tribute to heroes. And this was um, a, a standing together where pop culture icons um, were sending a message. Uh, this is our expression of political unity. Um, now that, that sense, you know, what do we do, uh, and, and that sense that this is how we express um, our solidarity still is an artifact of popular culture. And the overt message is clear. America is united. America is standing up for itself. Um, America, uh, even, you know, uh, left wing, right wing people in Hollywood can come together um, and, and have this program. You might also recall Morgan Spurlock Super Size Me, which um, short circuits uh, the policy process and ends up um, embarrassing uh, fast food restaurants to change their menus. I mean, it, it's, it's thanks to supersize me that I can go into McDonald's and order apples for my two-year-old, right? Um, or a salad. Uh, so uh, we have here an attempt at policy change, at least for the uh, fast food restaurants who are affected by it, and only now do we see legislatures having uh, legislation that, that are addressing these um, health issues. Uh, but there are other examples of more uh, subtle or covert uh, messages in popular culture. Um, and like I said, uh, these we don't have time to talk about all of these today, um, but you'll see in a film like Hotel Rwanda or in a show like Ellen, um, which I mentioned before, um, a program like 24. Uh, you know, Jack Bauer, if there's any Jack Bauer fans out there, they're going to come up with a movie. Um, I hope it's not 24 hours long because I think we're going to have to watch it. Um, but uh, that, that's a show where, you know, you can, we, we like using that as an example because it's not always left wing uh, messages in popular culture. Dissent can also be um, in, in favor of a particular way of conducting foreign policy, for example. If only we had Jack Bauer torturing every terrorist we found, we would get, you know, we would have found bin Laden, we would uh, have won the war in Afghanistan by now. Um, and so the message of that show really reinforces that idea. In fact, so much so that um, it was surprising for us at the beginning, although now we, we like it when it happens because it proves uh, that we're right, but um, on talk radio, Jack Bauer is an actual person who conducts foreign policy. And so when there's roundtable discussions about the war on terrorism among po certain policymakers, um, Jack Bauer comes up as an example of why we should conduct foreign policy a certain way. Um, and so, you know, we might laugh or, or get uh, slightly terrified, but um, the, the idea is that pop culture has an impact in how we think about politics and how we think about um, the world. Um, the Daily Show is, is another example um, where uh, Jon Stewart, the Colbert Report, uh, uh, also um, is affecting the, the way people talk about politics. So um, there was a period of time where people were tuning into The Daily Show to get their news. Actually, um, we find among young people that more people get their news from The Daily Show and then when they're polled, they actually know more about the world than people who watch regular network news. Um, so if Jon Stewart is the only one reporting, even though he's doing it um, with a funny uh, uh, slant, um, then we, our world has changed and pop culture is, is, is changing the world. Um, you also have an example of like the Red Campaign, which is uh, an attempt by um, a, a businesses, a commercial attempt to draw attention to issues. Um, and so any and all of these things we can talk about in the question and answer period, but, but these are all examples we cover in the book. Um, and I, I, because we're, we're short on time, and I want to be sure we have time for questions, um, th there are some who object uh, to the idea, who argue against us, um, that uh, people participating in politics through popular culture somehow minimizes um, what we consider to be pop, uh, political activity. So if someone's sitting at home watching TV and they're engaging in politics, isn't that an excuse then to sit at home and not engage in politics? Um, and we are concerned about that question, and we can talk about it more, but um, uh, I think that one of the main arguments that um, I, I want to leave you with is the italics uh, bold bullet point at the bottom. Um, if you were in my class, I'd explain that anything in italics and bold you should write down in your notes because it means it's on an exam. 
Um, but our argument is that producing and consuming culture are our political activities that have a rightful place in our conception of the public sphere. And so if we approach the public sphere thinking that young people, people who are having their political identities formed are only doing so on the Capitol steps or in the classroom or in a town hall meeting, then we're missing a really significant place where in America, people's political identities are being formed. I'm gonna turn it back over to Joe before we end. To mention, for example, the, uh, the notion of the Daily Show and people going there for information and getting you know, real information that was, uh, that was actually actionable information that they could make decisions based on what they were getting from that. And I mean, we see here some of the kinds of things that the Daily Show is comically taking on. U.S. and foreign affairs, election and politics, government, lifestyle, press media uh, is, a, is, a, is a big, uh, uh, big time consumed. Uh, by The Daily Show is, is on all of this. And in fact, if we were to ask the question whether or not The Daily Show is good for democracy, we might actually compare The Daily Show and what they cover versus what the mainstream media covers. And they actually spend more time on things like foreign affairs, um, not just U.S. foreign policy, but politics of other countries that may not directly involve U.S. engagement. Uh, and so they're uh, engaging and addressing issues that the mainstream media may not otherwise uh, ever cover. They likewise have the, the, the sort of now the reputation of being able to go back and find footage of things that you said 10 years ago and things that you said 10 minutes ago that just contradict each other, really calling politicians to task, which is changing the way that the mainstream media is, is, is also doing business. We're seeing people like Bill O'Reilly, we're seeing people like Bill Maher now trying to do some of the same things and engaging Christine O'Donnell. Uh, John Stewart has also been uh, been named as uh, as one of the most admired journalists. Um, Time Magazine poll uh, named him the most trusted newscaster in America. And actually, regular viewers of the Daily Show scored the highest in the percentile of political knowledge in a survey conducted in 2007. And right, in this regard, then we're seeing that there is a role that popular culture is playing, and popular culture is facilitating that is not only challenging the mainstream discussion, but it's setting the public agenda. The Tea Party rallies are largely a product of entertainment culture, of Glenn Beck, and of the ability to rally that kind of mentality, right? Same with the 1030 rallies that Stewart and Colbert are doing as a response. They are also helping to set the public agenda. They are rallying a certain kind of mobilization and tapping into a certain kind of mobilization. This is being done not by traditional mainstream politicians. This is being done by purveyors of popular culture who are actually setting the national dialogue, are influencing what we're talking about, and moreover, they're influencing how we talk about it. And so to bring this back around to The Simpsons, we have, uh, I think, probably one of the best examples in the book uh, was done by a colleague and a friend of ours, Matthew Henry, uh, who writes about how The Simpsons engages religion. And what's so fascinating about this is that The Simpsons has been claimed as a secular, uh, anti-religious message. It's been claimed as a purely Christian message. There's a book, the, Co the Gospel According to The Simpsons, that's out there saying, see, it's all Christian. And what's so fascinating about this is Matthew Henry says, look, all of these views are being presented. Right, in a way that's neither red nor blue, but is truly purple. But it's causing us as individuals to begin to think about the way in which this dialogue is happening and to begin to engage in understanding of each other differently because we dedicate 23 minutes plus commercials once a week to watching these kinds of programs. So with that said, it's always more interesting to hear from you uh, in terms of your questions and what you're interested in. So we will, uh, we will just offer uh, a bit of thanks, uh, first of all, and then open it up to all of you. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Sorry, up here. Oh. I have the gospel according to the Simpsons, and the uh, question I have is: uh, About 20 years ago, I read a article in the Daily Oklahoma, the Oklahoma City newspaper, that talked about the liberal views of many of the Hollywood writers and producers. Um, do you think that in the flyover country we live in? that uh, the message that is spoken by these people through their shows resonates with people in this area of the country. 
actually one of the things that we find that, that is consistent throughout popular cultures, even though there may be sort of a, 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 a they're, they're, you know, self-identified liberal purveyors of popular culture, we find that it also, as, as Alexis de Tocqueville would remind us in, a, in Democracy in America, we can't, as Americans, separate our day-to-day -day activities from our de democratic ideals. Within American culture itself, there's this, this kind of anti-government sentiment, uh, the idea that people, not government, are solutions. And we see that time and again in popular culture, even so-called liberal popular culture, where there's a rejection of government solutions, of state solutions, bureaucracy standing in the way of individuals being able to actually deliver real solutions. And so we have two chapters, uh, for example, in the book that deals with images in the bureaucracy, as well as the popular TV show House that all seem to reflect this idea of a moral individualism which was, is, is very rampant in American culture. Uh, that, is, that, it, that, that seems to reject top-down collective solutions in favor of these moral individualists who will disregard policy in order to be able to deliver a sort of human element for resolving issues and conflicts. And so in that regard, not only do we have uh, messaging like uh, 24, uh, uh, Toby Keith's messaging uh, through country music following uh, September 11, 2001, we do see right-wing political culture, we see reactionary political culture, but we also see a strand of political culture that seems to run throughout that reflects some of the very tenets of political culture within the United States. And I know Tim has a little bit more to say about this. Yeah, I think um, that, that what we were kind of surprised because we also had this idea that what we find is a lot of liberal left-wing messaging, um, but, but we actually found that it, it is libertarian. Um, we see much, I mean, actually, um, there are very few, if any, positive depictions of government in popular. So you do not see apologies for national health care in popular culture. You don't see apologies for the welfare state in popular culture. Um, so in that way, the messaging is definitely libertarian. Um, and, and we're working on our next book project now, and we're making choices uh, about chapters um, that, that uh, may, may have uh, worked in this book about the superhero narrative and how that really is a, a statement of conservative values, that it takes a kind of moral individualist to accomplish something that uh, you need the bat signal because government isn't going to work, right? And um, I think that's uh, really why this stuff is so successful, no matter if it's in South Carolina or Massachusetts or California or Texas. Um, this, this is not messaging that is, that is being directed to um, a democratic party of liberals. It's being directed to an American public that really is libertarian. I'm very glad that you guys have brought up that, that uh, ideologically popular culture is, is uh, all over the place. But it seems to me that there is a difference. Uh, when you get conservative popular culture, people like Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh, their emotion that they exploit seems to be always anger and rage. Whereas on the left, with Michael Moore and uh, Al Franken and John Stewart, it seems to be mostly humor rather than rage. What is that about, do you think? It's a really excellent question in terms of why it is that different messages will resonate differently. Uh, I know that some of my colleagues in, in both the biological sciences and in psychology send me articles a lot from scientific magazines that talk about the way in which liberals view the world versus how conservatives view the world uh, in terms of their understanding of how information takes place. And so it may very well be that what they're just doing is they're just merely tapping into the different kinds of psychologies that help to influence the filters that we put on, the ideological filters uh, that we tend to put on. Um, and certainly, you know, liberals have attempted to actually Ma, uh, you know, mimic uh, some of the conservative, the, the right-wing conservative talk show, and it's been largely unsuccessful. Something like Air America, um, uh, Keith Olbermann, and 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 Rachel Maddow, which are which are very highly respected amongst uh, liberal audiences. Uh, you know, they're they're they. Sometimes, you know, with something like the worst person in the world that, that, that Keith Olbermann does, it tries to kind of tap into that, but it ends up coming across more comical, more humor-based. Uh, and so I think that that really is sort of tapping into different types of psychology of different kinds of voters. Uh, humor seems to work well with one audience, uh, and tapping into some of the, 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 the really deep-seated uh, distrust of those kinds of centralized solutions seems to, seems to work on the right. I guess 
I'd be curious to hear what you think of Stephen Colbert um, in the Congressional Committee this morning and also uh, running for president uh, in the South Carolina primary. You talked a lot about uh, politicians entering culture, but what about when culture um, enters politics? Yeah, I think um, uh, living in South Carolina at the time that Colbert is visiting and wreaking havoc on the state, even talking to the Democratic Party chair down there, he was causing headaches, but making the rest of the country laugh. And I think um, th this really is a, a, a good example where, um, as you say, popular culture enters politics. And um, I, think, I think from a political science standpoint, we could say that the decline of party influence and the decline of um, kind of the, the institutional design of parties allows access for a lot of these people. It turns out in South Carolina to get on the ballot, all you need is $10,000. Um, and uh, it, as it's by the Democratic Senate candidate down there. Um, and so uh, what, I, what I think Colbert is, is doing there and, and in congressional testimony is that um, one, of the, one of the things that, that we find it, when we look at these pop culture uh, icons, Colbert, Stewart, um, is that they really care about the world. They're doing what they do in part to entertain. They love to entertain. They start as stand-up comics. Um, but th they're doing it because they care about what goes on. And so um, I think, you know, w we probably know that that's, uh, Colbert isn't seriously thinking that he's going to win the election. Um, but by doing this, he's taking on a kind of responsibility. So this is what I think is, is so funny about, um, you know, by the way, our, our hope is to be invited on the, to the Daily Show, uh, Colbert. So if any of you know them, uh, we, we talk about them a lot. Actually, that was second to being invited to the Clinton School for Public. Uh, but when, when, when Stewart says, I'm the most trusted name in news, tongue in cheek, and then gets voted the most trusted name in news, Right? When Colbert runs for office tongue in cheek, but then you have these moments of breakthrough when he's being his most sarcastic and over the top in his show, but then you see these cracks of why he's doing what he's doing. Um, I think it reminds us that the people who are creating these uh, pop culture texts that we're talking about are trying to change the world. And so we, to, to, to think that they're just entertaining us or just running for president to show how stupid politics are, um, I, I think that's part of it, but, but I think it's helpful to be reminded that, that these people care. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Morgan. I'm a student here at the Clinton School. I just want to thank you both for coming and sharing your research and insights. We really appreciate that. Um, I have a two-parter, if you'll uh, bear with me. Um, this last statistic I think is fascinating about the uh, viewers of The Daily Show scoring higher in the political knowledge survey. I wonder if there's any evidence for that being indicative of sort of a daily show as a gateway to more serious media. Because I know from personal experience, a lot of my friends, that's how they got their news in college and are now, of course, reading more quote unquote serious uh, media. So that's the first part. Second part would be, I noticed you're always careful to distinguish um, the mainstream media when you talk about the, um, the larger media environment. Is that because um, you think that independent media is better at highlighting some of these things, or is there a blur between independent media and pop culture, or can you talk about that a little bit? Thank you. Yeah. In, in regard to the first question, uh, there, there's a number of studies that have been done about, uh, about the, the, the level of political information that people were getting, because for a long time what people thought was, well, of course they're going to score higher. Nobody else is going to tune into these shows and get the joke unless they were already informed. So we had a little bit of an endogeneity problem. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the first book that I did in Goes to Washington, Christopher Cooper and Mandy Bates Bailey did independent research looking into viewers who, who were not regular consumers of information, had low levels of political knowledge, and had them uh, watch The Daily Show, comparing that with results from people who had then watched the, the traditional media, what we're considering the mainstream media, and that once again they found that not only did those individuals gain information just by watching The Daily Show, uh, but they were actually scoring better, uh, again, in these kinds of studies. So 
in that regard, uh, whether or not it opens sort of continued doors, uh, what they're finding is that there's real information that's being presented here. And, you know, what's critical is it's being framed in a very particular kind of way, uh, you know, and, and that kind of leads me into the answer to the second question, which is we are using mainstream media to try to distinguish between the second order knowledge of what we traditionally understood as the hard news broadcast versus the entertainment media, the infotainment, soft news. Um, there have been a lot of different labels uh, associated with that. So what we, what we found is it's easier to distinguish the mainstream media and our traditional understanding of news and then recognize that, uh, that that's distinct from what we're trying to study in terms of popular culture. Although that line even and of itself is becoming blurred. As we recently found out, many networks, Fox News for example, just came out and sort of said, Look, in a 24-hour news cycle, we, we maybe offer about four hours of actual news coverage. The rest really is just punditry, is about entertainment. And so we're seeing, and in the book, uh, it's talked about how mainstream news media is actually trying to co-opt some of these elements in order to try to re capture a larger viewing audience. We've seen the, the Tea Party candidates win on low turnouts. And here you have Colbert and John Stewart with this rally on October 30th. Do you all think that this is a subliminal display of force on the left, or it could alter the turnout in the upcoming elections, which are four days later? I, I will say that, that I'm going to let Tim give a, a, a better, probably, answer than this, but I can tell you that, that exactly what you're saying is, is Glenn Beck's uh, assumption about these rallies. That when, that when he started talking about these, my initial assumption was going to be Beck is going to criticize the sort of intellectual leftist elite making fun of the base of the Tea Party. That was not his message at all. His message was a fear of youth voters being mobilized and that that would turn the election against the Republican Party and against Tea Party candidates. So certainly there is this sort of idea that, that this kind of response uh, is, is mobilizing, is activating a, a certain demographic base that a, at least uh, purveyors of, of right-wing political culture, of, of entertainment media like Glenn Beck are, are afraid that it's going to be disadvantageous to Tea Party candidates and more extreme candidates perhaps broadly. But I'll let Tim maybe respond. Well, I think this also connects back to something that um, we were talking about a few minutes ago, which is that um, I think that the, the if I were going to answer that people on the right tend to be angry, people on the left tend to be snarky and sarcastic. <laughs> and um, generally speaking, uh, both impulses cause us to not want to participate. Right? And so we, we get people who don't want to vote because they're mad, or they don't want to vote because they're snarky and sarcastic and sitting on their couch watching shows. And um, what I think is so interesting about, and, and really it's probably going to keep us in writing books for a few more years, is that um, I think the, the, the Beck Stewart thing, that's a title for a, a book, if not a chapter, um, that the Beck Stewart thing is actually about taking the anger, which might otherwise cause people to stay home, or taking the snarky sarcasm that might otherwise cause people to open a bag of Doritos and watch another episode of The Simpsons, um, to actually get involved. So the message from, from Stewart is, yes, the world is crazy and we can make a lot of fun of it, but you should care. And so I think that this is going to be something really interesting to watch. And, and I think that you're, so what I think is interesting too is that um, it's, it, it, it's come to Stewart trying to mobilize the Democratic base. I mean, who's, who, who's mobilizing the base? It's John Stewart and Colbert. Um, and so it's, we, we see mainstream media giving up on, you know, what we might think of as a tradition, what, what media should do. Um, and we're also seeing politicians give up on what politicians should do. And so there's not a counter rally by the Democrats. There's a counter rally by a snarky, sarcastic cable news show. And um, so, I mean, it, well, on the one hand, we can uh, lament this and think, well, this is the, you know, the downfall of civilization. Um, we kind of like it, no, number one, because we get to write books about it. But um, we also like it because I think we're seeing a new generation of activism that we just conceive differently than what we've seen before. And so, you know, I don't think we should be upset that Stewart is trying to encourage political participation. I think as political scientists, we're very interested to see if it works, right? A midterm election in a president's first term is not a happy thing, generally speaking, for the party that's in power. 
Um, but I, I think it's going to be interesting, and I think after uh, the election, um, there's going to be a lot to talk about. We have time for one more right here. Right, here, right in front. Bill, in front, come towards me. Yeah. I'd like, to, I'd like your take on um, this phenomenon of having entertainers like uh, Angelina Jolie and Sean Penn go up uh, in front of congressional meetings and their opinion being uh, uh, held in such high esteem, they're entertainers. So I'd like to know, you know, if that's your opinion on, is that dumbing down the, the political process or? Well, I can tell you that, that there's a really big part of me that says thank you for those entertainers existing. Uh, one of the, 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 the policy issues that I've been sort of most concerned with uh, is aspects of conflict and division within Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, when we look at the, the, the genocide in the Darfur region in Sudan, uh, the, the, the Khartoum government is being supported primarily by two foreign states, Egypt and China. The highest level American delegation to ever go to Egypt, even after the United States declared that situation genocide, was Don Cheadle and George Clooney. That was the highest level delegation that we sent. Now in that regard, in looking at the way in which these entertainers are engaging in political issues, we find that, that oftentimes they're criticized for being one trick ponies, right? Unless you're Bono and you're saving the entire world, right? You usually focus on one particular kind of issue. And so we find that in a way, they, they have access to resources, to experts, they're writing books with, with scholars uh, who are, uh, you know, who would otherwise, nobody would ever pick up and read. They have the, the platform and the forum to be able to actually deliver with policy expertise, with charisma, and with celebrity that makes other people want to tune in and witness and watch. And, and, and so they're changing a dialogue and influencing a dialogue that I think we would not pay attention to otherwise, and that, and that, that, other, that, that other politicians would not pay attention to otherwise. Um, so I don't think that there's, there's any more sort of a dumbing down of those issues from these individuals engaging in sort of single issue politics than we would expect from individual politicians who are trying to take on everything and having really an expertise in nothing. Uh, and so in that regard, then, I'm, I, I actually see this as being very beneficial to, to the, the, the political dialogue. Let's thank uh, Tim and Joe for this. <laughs> now's your chance for yourself and for your friends. Homer Simpson marches on Washington. Uh, we're glad you were here. Uh, have a great weekend and uh, watch the house or what, what's other, what, what do you recommend? What's the, what's, what's, the, what's the most influential pop besides Stuart Gilbert? Just, like the house. Keep watching The Simpsons. It needs to be on TV for a while. <laughs> Keep watching The Simpsons. Thank you all for coming.